Good afternoon. Welcome to the regular Friday meeting of the City Club of Portland. I'm Jim Westwood, your president. It falls my pleasant task each uh, Friday to present the new members of City Club. I'd ask each of you seated at the new member table to stand and for members to hold their applause until I've introduced each of our new members who's present. First is Judy Buffo, president of Telluric Enterprises. Catherine Drown, consulting actuary, Howard Johnson and Company. Brian King, property tax consultant with Property Tax Research Company. Thurl Stalnecker, an attorney with Schulte Anderson in Portland. Carl Vischer, senior planning analyst at Pacific Bell. And Gerald Wolf, vice president for marketing of National Meeting Company. Welcome all of you to City Club. We're pleased to have you. <laughs> Thanks too to recruiters Leslie Hajula and Ted Kay. Next Friday, December 13th, here at City Club, we'll present Charlie Hinkle, former president of the Oregon affiliate of the American Civil Liberties Union and a partner with Stoll Reeves, Bowley Jones, and Gray in Portland, and also a former president of the Portland City Club. He'll speak on, and I think this title must have been thought up for purposes of getting the audience in, Sex, Race, Free Speech, and the Supreme Court. Well, it should be interesting. Mr. Hinkle is going to take a look at the Rehnquist Court's attitude towards civil rights and civil liberties, and I think I can guarantee you it'll be an interesting presentation. That's next Friday, December 13th, here at the Benson Hotel in the Mayfair Room. City Club holds a new member reception next Thursday, December 12th, from 5 to 6.30 p.m. at the City Club office. If you're a new member and you missed earlier receptions, or if you're a new member and have yet to attend such a reception, uh, we want, to get, want you to get better acquainted with City Club members and hear about volunteer opportunities, so please do plan to attend. Uh, City Club board members will be there. The speaker will be Judith Romaley, president of Portland State University. If you would like to attend, please call Debbie at the City Club office to RSVP. I know invitations have gone out to the new members. It's a well worth attending. Here's a special holiday gift idea for your City Club friends or prospective City Club members, and that, of course, is our fine City Club mug. The mugs are on sale today at the back of the room and will be so at the end of the program and in weeks to come, but remember there aren't many shopping days left till Christmas, so buy your City Club mugs. Take advantage of this opportunity to support the club and your friends at the same time. Our board host today seated at the head table is Mary McWilliams, member of the Board of Governors and Chief Executive Officer of Sisters of Providence Health Plans. She will have the honor of the first question of our speakers. The second question today will be asked from the floor by Doug McCourt, Chair of the Energy and Environment Standing Committee of the City Club. After that, as always, we open up the floor to questions from City Club members in the audience after our speakers' prepared remarks. Uh, written questions will be asked as time allows. There are forms on your tables. If you would prefer to ask a question in writing, hand it to staff at the end of speakers' remarks, and we'll, they'll bring them up here, and we can ask written questions as time permits. We always give preference, however, to questions from live bodies on the floor. I want to remind people, as I always do, that questions ought to end in a question mark. A brief introductory uh, statement of, of view or opinion is certainly always in order if it is brief, but uh, please remember that there should be a question asked at the end of any <coughs> such statements as well. It seems that in past years, most environmental issues were fought over by, in effect, the professional soldiers. Much as in 18th century European warfare, there were relatively few non-combatants involved in or suffering from battles that were fought by rather small bands of soldiers. So it was that the North Cascades National Park had its boundaries set in the late 1960s, and in fact, even the Alaska Pipeline was built in the 1970s, outside of the interest zone of most members of the general public. Things are quite a bit different today. With the international economic system showing greater delicacy and more cracks than most of us feel comfortable with, and with environmental issues like spotted owl and salmon preservation threatening to affect the lives and the pocketbooks of us all in pretty big ways, I think we can say that the wars have come to the civilian populace. We all have pressing reasons to be involved in and to debate where the balance can be struck. City Club today, I'm proud to say, is a forum for such a dialogue on just such a question. Where can we turn to find reliable economic energy sources? In particular, should we look for and tap the probable petroleum reserves that underlie the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge in northern Alaska? Here to debate that issue today, or at least to engage in a dialogue on it, we have Roger Herrera and Jeffrey Eustace. 
Mr. Herrera is executive consultant to the president of BP Exploration Alaska. He's a native Welshman, educated at Oxford, but presently lives in Anchorage, Alaska. He's worked in oil fields around the world. Jeffrey Eustace is an attorney in practice in Seattle. His practice emphasizes land use and environmental law. He's a graduate of Harvard College and, um, as I said, is a, an attorney in practice in Seattle. He is also a member of the steering committee of the Alaska Coalition of Washington. I think it's safe to say that our two speakers bring different points of view to the controversy over energy. Each of our speakers will speak for 10 to 15 minutes. Um, following that, we'll open the floor up to questions, and I would introduce first Roger Herrera of BP Alaska. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and ladies and gentlemen of the City Club. Uh, you know, last night, my wife and I are staying in this hotel, and we were going back to our room, and my wife said to me, you know, Roger, the people of Portland are extraordinarily kind. And even I recognize the truth of that remark. I'm usually pretty slow in such things, but she is right. And long may you keep those rather rare uh, characteristics, because uh, they're, of, they're of greater value than anything else that uh, you can uh, give to the outside world. Uh, and in some regards today, I I'm not coming here to uh, lecture you or to um, harangue you at all. I'm coming here, in essence, um, I'm, I think at least to help you preserve those characteristics because you rely, we all rely on a great deal of energy. Uh, it's easy to be cheerful when everything is going well. It is very difficult when you can't find your, your next meal. And this is why the third world countries of this world are not very good at protecting their environment. You have to be well off to protect the environment, and therefore it's to our benefit that we remain well off. Now, what's that got to do with the energy bill in, in, in the United States uh, Senate Congress that's being debated uh, uh, this uh, congressional session? Well, in the state of Oregon, uh, you use on a daily basis uh, something between eight and nine million gallons of petroleum products every day. Now, that's approximately four gallons per person. Now, you might say that that's not much until you remember that, of course, half the population don't drive automobiles and so on, and it becomes um, somewhat disturbing at that time. Perhaps it should be disturbing also uh, because you well recognize the benefits you get from using that energy, but do you also recognize that all of it comes from the state of Alaska? all of it. Now what's going to happen with that source in the future? Is it going to be there so that you can continue to be kind and mellow and pleasant people? Or are you going to be in difficulties down the road? Well, as you all are aware, today we in the United States of America import more than 50 percent of our petroleum needs from foreign sources. And as one looks into the future, one sees inevitably an increase in the number of those imports that we need to maintain our lifestyle. And as one looks into that future, all those imports increasingly come from the Persian Gulf area, simply because over two-thirds of the world's oil reserves reside beneath the sands of that part of the world. Now, do you remember that we fought a war there just a few months ago? It's surprising, but most people have forgotten. And you know, in the debate, which uh, the United States Senate just undertook on the first of, uh, just before November of this year. The senator, the senior senator from Oregon, Senator Hatfield, he asked the rhetorical question, are we here to debate energy or don't we care about it? And you know clearly the answer, actions speak louder than words, is that perhaps the Senate of the United States doesn't care. Well, should they? Should we? The problem we have is that we don't have an energy policy and haven't had one for many, many decades in this country. The problem we have is that the price of a gallon of gas in Portland, Oregon today is cheaper than it was 60 years ago during the Great Depression. That's ridiculous, isn't it? But that's a fact. The problem we have is that 
we are increasingly dependent on energy in this country. We are unwilling to conserve energy in this country. So what should we do about it? And Congress, I think, was uh, being very responsible in its approach to this. It said we have to get this energy problem under, under control and do something about it in a logical fashion. And what Congress decided was logic, and I would agree with them, was that we have to produce more domestic energy in the United States of America and in particular oil, for the simple reason that every barrel of oil we produce in this country, it displaces a barrel of oil we have to import. Now the problem with imported oil is not that it's in short supply, or even that it comes from the Persian Gulf. The problem is that we can't afford to pay for it. That's why we have this huge balance of payments deficit in this country. Half of that deficit is due to the price of imported oil. And clearly we can't afford it. You know, another problem with imported oil, which Jeff should be interested in, is the fact that it's produced with far less environmental care than oil in this country. Whenever we import a barrel of oil from the Persian Gulf or from most other countries around the world, we're importing oil produced by a national government oil company. The last thing they are concerned about is the environment. They're concerned about their economy and meeting their quotas and so on and so forth. The Soviet Union is a case in point. And so we're importing some unnecessary degradation of the world's environment when we use a, a, a barrel of foreign oil. So what, you might say? Well, if we think that planet Earth is a delicate structure that we should protect, then clearly we should have a conscience about importing oil which is more environmentally damaging than our domestic oil. But that's only one part of the energy equation, more domestic energy. The other part is we have to conserve more. We have to be more careful how we use our, our sources of energy. And the problem with that is that we're all um, proponents of conservation, all of us without exception. And we do our little thing with, with tin cans and bottles and newspapers and so on and so forth, and perhaps even with our automobiles. We, perhaps we think twice before we get into our cars, although that's the exception rather than the rule, as we all know. But the problem is that the major method of conserving energy in this country is by not driving automobiles or driving automobiles which are much more efficient than the ones we presently drive. 63% of our oil is burned up in engines. 63%. And so if we're going to save oil, we clearly have to attack that problem. Now, you tell that to the city of Detroit or, to the, or the automobile unions, and you have a fight on your hands. And probably the major reason that the energy debate did not result in a, or rather the energy vote in the Senate on 1st of November did not result in a subsequent debate was because those auto unions were defending jobs. They were not going to allow us to have more efficient automobiles and therefore save energy in that fashion. We'll come back to that. The third thing that the energy bill tried to do was to produce new and different and better and cheaper and more environmentally benign sources of energy. That's motherhood. We all agree with that. The problem with that, though, is it's easier said than done. I mean, clearly we have to try to get off oil. Oil is expensive. We can't afford it. It has these nasty things like carbon chains in it which go up into the atmosphere and so on and so forth. But alternative sources today represent only in a year's um, use of, of uh, transportation in this country, alternative energy only fires up our planes and automobiles for 55 hours in every year. The rest of the 363 days, we burn oil. Now, does that stop us from developing new energy sources? No, it doesn't. But it surely hasn't stopped the Europeans and the Japanese that for the past 30 years have been working under this huge competitive disadvantage of the price of a gallon of gasoline. In Europe, since the Second World War, a gallon of gasoline has been three or four or five times higher for them to produce their products and compete on the world market than it has been for us, similarly in Japan. If that's not an incentive for those highly intelligent people to develop alternative energy forms, I don't know what is, and yet they haven't done it. My point is, it's not going to be easy to do that, and although that should have been part of the energy bill and should be pursued, it is not the holy grail, it is not the quick answer, 
It might be an answer over decades and decades rather than the next five years. We now are facing a crisis in the next five years because instead of 50% import importation of foreign oil, it's going to be up to 60% and as we go into the 21st century, 75%. Now let me just touch on Anwar and Alaska and how it fits into your well-being here that keeps you kind and happy. You rely wholly on Alaskan energy from the North Slope, Alaskan oil. And that is declining as you well know. And you also all know, I'm sure, that it is everybody's um, responsible opinion that the coastal plain, the 1.5 million acres, a small sliver of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, has greater potential for new commercial deposits of oil than any other place in North America. Even the environmentalists agree with that, even the extreme ones. Now, are we to develop that? I suppose, and, and therefore, look after your futures, because if your oil doesn't come from Alaska, where is it going to come from? And what implications does that have on your economy here? I don't know the answer to that, but clearly, the implications are, are somewhat worrisome. The point is that the coastal plain of Anwar does have these theoretical prospects for huge quantities of future oil. And I would argue that the point is that you have been quite satisfied with receiving oil from Alaska now for almost 20 years because you have not heard that that, with a single disastrous exception of Exxon Valdez, that has clearly been detrimental to the environment. And it hasn't been. The record there speaks for itself. The record developed not by the oil industry or recorded not by the oil industry, but by the federal government and the state of Alaska. A great job has been done on the North Slope. And the job that would be done in the future on the North Slope, on the coastal plain of Anwar, would be even greater. So I think this is an English term. You can have your cake and eat it too. You can have your oil from beneath the coastal plain, and you can say with a degree of certainty more certainty than we face in our energy future in this country, with a degree of certainty that caribou will still be there, that the natives will thrive in their subsistence economy on that area, that the area is not going to be ravaged. We're not going to see what the Industrial Revolution did to Britain and create a black country, which, by the way, is now green and lovely. We're not going to see that. The environment is going to be protected because today we are all, without exception, responsible environmentalists. Now, why, therefore, did the Senate vote against debate on this energy bill? They didn't even debate the bill. It was probably because of the superior lobbying power of the forces, the union and, and automobile manufacturing forces that didn't want conservation <coughs> to bite into their jobs. Now, jobs are important, and we're all feeling the pinch in this country today. Do you know if Anwar was developed the Walton School of Economics, which is a neutral uh, body of great repute, repute around the world, calculates that 735,000 jobs would be generated by producing and developing that oil from the North Slope of Alaska. And guess what? 30,000 of those jobs would be in the state of Oregon. So you can look forward if the coastal plain is opened, not only to the realization that Congress has bitten the bullet and now has voted on a responsible energy policy, but you are going to be beneficiaries of whatever oil is found in the North Slope of Alaska. Beneficiaries because it's going to be produced responsibly and well, and it will increase the benefits to your economy, both in jobs, in employment, in, um, in sure sources of energy. Now, I want to come here in 20 years' time and see you all equally kind and smiling. So I hope you will influence the outcome of this debate. Thank you. Thank you, Roger Herrera. We'll hear next from Jeff Eustace of the Alaska-Washington Coalition. Thank you very much. As a native Northwesterner, I know we are all very nice people. <clears throat> and I really have to credit the City Club for organizing this. This was initially going to be a uh, discussion on the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, a topic that is guaranteed despite the rain and everything else, to generate sparks, an independent source of energy 
between Roger and myself. So correctly, the City Club suggested, let's just talk about, let's elevate it and talk about energy policy uh, rather than the Arctic. Um, so that's what we will address here. Um, to begin with talking about the benefits of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, I think, is to assume the conclusion of the debate. Basically, the issue of what the energy policy should be is really an issue of three things. One, how can we get the energy to heat our houses, uh, provide our transportation, and to produce the goods we need? How can we do so in an economic and reliable way? And how can we do so in a way that does not degrade our environment? What, we're, what we need is to satisfy those needs. Heating our houses, moving goods, and producing goods, moving ourselves too. We don't need itself in abstract to produce oil. The current policies of our country, if you could call them that, are very much directed towards the production of coal, coal and oil. They're, directed, they're very dependent upon foreign sources of oil, and they're producing a steady degradation of the environment. Our energy supplies come approximately 40% from oil, another 20 plus percent from coal, the remaining natural gas around 20%, nuclear around 6%, and 7% for renewables, such as hydropower, solar, wind, and biomass. By far, the largest comes from oil. And by far, as Roger indicated, something like two-thirds of that goes towards transportation. And most of that is used for the cars. Now, for this oil, we get approximately 50% Despite all the productivity of the state of Alaska, 50% comes from overseas. And as we go to the year 2010, that will increase to, 2000, to, to 75%. Now, we have a problem here. Right now, we are producing approximately 20% uh, of the world's oil, and we're consuming about 30% of the world's oil. Yet, the US supplies of the total world proven reserves is about 5%. We are now spending it far faster than we can produce it. And in the future, I mean, we're basically producing, spending it far faster than the future could ever sustain it. It is quite clear that no matter where we drill, we, there is no way that the United States can drill itself into um, oil independence. The other thing is that we have all these hidden subsidies. Right now we pay at the pump when we go to fill up a tank of gas. We pay whatever, anywhere from around a dollar to a dollar thirty for a gallon of gas. And that reflects the, the price for a barrel of oil um, around twenty dollars. However, that does not fully account for the cost of that oil. There are many areas where, in our economy, we are subsidizing this price of oil. You recall that we fought a war. Now, most people would say that war was not over democracy in Kuwait. That war was over security for oil. We pay a great deal of money to maintain our, quote unquote, military security in the Mideast. That is for oil. That is not because these are democracies. There are other respects in which our economy subsidizes oil. We subsidize it through tax credits and tax deductions. They pay less taxes than you or I do. In other respects, there are many external costs that are not folded in on the price of the gallon that you pay at the pump. For example, it is estimated that there is a loss every year of 2.5 to $6 billion in crop losses because of increased ozone due to uh, the combustion of oil. So there are many other estimates. Uh, for corrosion impacts, $2 billion. Health impacts, $80 billion, principally from particulates from coal. Military costs, $54 billion. And not, that is not reflected at what we pay, but we are paying for it anyway because it's a closed system. An even more serious cost is the one of global warming. Despite the 
constant denials of the now departed chief of staff, we have to accept that global warming is a reality. Over the last century, approximately um, one half degree centigrade um, in, in increase in the um, average world temperature. Now that may not seem to be very much, but bear in mind that the ice age itself was accompanied with a decrease in temperature of about five degrees centigrade. At a 1987 international conference on global warming, there was a consensus that the, the a consensus dealing with the increase in the, the world temperature over uh, into the next century. And, and there was a consensus by the middle of the next century that increase would be five degrees centigrade. At the conservative side, one degree centigrade. And there have been all sorts of reports indicating that this will result in tremendous dislocation, will result in uh, rain falling in greater quantities uh, where people don't want it, and other areas being turned to deserts and the uh, uh, ocean levels rising and flooding out areas along the coasts. These are costs that in no way are we taking account of right now. Um, the logical direction would be, if you were forging an energy policy and taking these factors into consideration, what you would want is a policy that decreased dependence upon foreign oil, one that accounted for the tremendous externalities, these external costs of which I was just speaking of, and also did something about the contribution of, to global warming. 50% of the gases associated with global warming are due to carbon dioxide. Half of that is a result of the way we run our transportation. Yet the so-called National Energy Security Act, the bill that was being debated last session, basically took a very strong supply-side approach to energy. A key provision within this act was basically to drill more. There was a direction to the Minerals Management Service to reconsider exploring and developing oil on the entire OCS, including the areas off of California, uh, Oregon, I understand, and Washington, which have been under a moratorium, and also to drill in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Now, to what end? The Arctic National Wildlife Refuge is projected to um, have something like the median estimate is anywhere from 3.2 to 6 billion barrels total. That is approximately 3% of the estimated national, proven national um, reserves for oil. It, in terms of a 125-mile area of coastline, it may have good prospects. But in terms of solving a national energy problem, it's literally just a drop in the bucket. What other things did this so-called national energy strategy do? Well, one thing it did was to try to streamline regulations dealing with coal development, wanted to make refurbished plants exempt from certain air quality limitations imposed by the 1990 Clean Air Act. It also put very heavy ev emphasis on nuclear power. Now, nuclear power only accounts for something like 7% of our energy production. You know in the Northwest, that nuclear power is not associated with efficiency. It's associated with um, a boondoggle, a great loss of money, a loss of something like $15 billion. Yet what this policy would do is not only forgive something like $10 billion in loans, but then turn around and loan another $10 billion to, to the nuclear energy. On the demand side, the policy provides only lip service. It basically holds investments to renewable energy sources, such as solar, wind power, hydro, and biomass, just to the rate of inflation. And for conservation, it actually decreases the amount of investment from the federal government by something like 30%. So what to do? Well, there were four well-respected national organizations who took a look at this issue and came up with their own energy plan. These were the Union of Concerned Scientists, the American Council for, energy, for an Energy Efficient Economy, the Natural Resources Defense Council, and the Alliance to Save Energy. And basically, they worked out three scenarios, or four scenarios. One was the reference case. 
what happens if we continue doing what we're doing? And then there were two, three other cases. One, a market case. What happens if we structure the economy so that all sources of energy compete on even par without heavily subsidizing one in, in neglect of another? Another one was the environmental scenario, greater emphasis upon renewable energies and energy efficiency. And the third one was climate stabilization. What we must do in order to produce a 25% reduction of um, CO, uh, CO2 by the year 2005 and 50% by the year 2030. And <clears throat> what in these references with these various scenarios, what they came up with was under the reference scenario, first they addressed production. Under the reference scenario, if we continue doing what we're doing, by the year 2030, on, un, on an annual basis, we will consume something like 120 quads of energy. Now a quad is a quadrillion BTUs. Currently, we consume about 30 quads of energy. So that would be about a 50% increase in the consumption of energy. Under their environmental case and under the climate stabilization case, there would be a re actually a reduction from the current level of 80 under the environmental stabilization case down to around 72 quads and under, excuse me, the environmental case down to 72 quads and under the climate stabilization case case down to 62 quads. These are respectively approximately 40% um, and 50% below what we would consume if we continued with normal trends. Now it's not surprising that this would also result in a sub significant savings of carbon dioxide. Um, the carbon di dioxide, if we continue doing what we're doing, we will end up contributing something like um, now we contribute around 5 billion tons of CO2 to the atmosphere. By the year 2030, if we continue on our current track, we will be contrib contributing over 8 billion tons of CO2. Under the environmental scenario, we could like, actually reduce this in half from 5 down to about 2.5 billion tons. Under the climate stabilization scenario, we could reduce this by um, about one-third down to about 1.5 billion tons. Now, this doesn't come cheap. It requires an investment. If you look at the investment over 40 years, over 40 years, this is discounted down to current dollars. In order to achieve the, um, these kinds of gains and the, under the environmental stabilization um, scenario, there would be a required investment of about $2 trillion. There would be an energy savings of about $4 trillion. There would be a net savings of $2 trillion over what would happen if we did nothing. For climate stabilization, there would be a required investment of $2.7 trillion, would have a net savings of around $5 trillion, excuse me, an energy savings of around $5 trillion, and a net savings of around $2.3 trillion. The Hopefully in the questions, I'm running short of time, um, and I'm mindful that this is your lunch hour. Um, hopefully in the questions I can tell you about some of the means by which energy efficiency and renewable energy resources can be tapped to address these two problems, relentless energy demand and the constant production of carbon dioxide. Now, what is clear, I think, after the, the Senate failed to act, what is clear is that at least the majority in the Senate will not accept a strictly supply-side approach to the energy policy. I think that Congress should use this as an opportunity to forge a national energy policy that would combine both economic prosperity and environmental integrity. The policies and directives needed to achieve an economically and environmentally sustainable future are not simple or cheap. But the consequences of not moving forward will be even more costly. In short, there is no time to wait. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jeff Eustis. Um, 
comes now the question portion of the program and the first question will be asked by our board host so mary take it away mary mcwilliams i wondered if you could both of you could speculate on when and how the national energy debate in congress will be renewed you know what will bring it on and what will the result be this time well i i suspect it'll come up in um early next year uh, for very uh, for, for very sort of political reasons. Um, basically, what the leader of the Senate, Senator Mitchell, did in um, cutting off a further uh, cloture votes, that is a vote to try to prevent the filibuster which was threatened on the energy bill, was to hand a victory to President Bush. And now, over the Christmas period, don't be surprised if you hear President Bush saying, hey guys, you know, if you are troubled by the lack of my uh, domestic agenda, that's where you want to look, at the Senate. The leader of the Senate who controls that body will not even debate the issue, let alone allow it to be voted upon. Now, Senator Mitchell, as a good, um, sharp uh, politician, knows this, and I suspect he will therefore try to bring up an attenuated energy bill in perhaps late January or February next year. That bill will probably uh, exclude CAFE standards, that's automobile efficiency standards, the main conservation part of the bill, and it will exclude uh, the coastal plain of Anwar consideration. However, of course, the rules of the Senate allow both of those things to be offered as amendments. So it could well be uh, interesting in February. Yeah. Well, if one thing is, I suppose, more certain than death and taxes, is it, it is that this legislation will always be back. Um, I can't speculate as to um, the form that it's going to be back in. I am actually much more certain that if there is legislation that does not deal with energy efficiency, that legislation is going to go nowhere. If my fear is that this will all become wrapped up in election politics, and it seems that there is very little willingness on the part of um, the Republican candidate to um, do anything that requires any discipline of us. He's speaking now of a tax break for the middle income. I, that's great, but he doesn't want to tax anything else. I don't know how anybody with a straight face and a good conscience can do that in the face of the fact that I would say that the principal reason for not having an economic recovery is debts, consumer debts, foreign debts, and national debts. But that's the direction we're taking. As you can see, there's a microphone on the floor now, and uh, if you have questions, please move to that microphone. Our second question today will be asked by Doug McCourt, who's chair of the Energy and Environment Standing Committee. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure the speakers are aware of this, but there are many generations of Oregonians represented in this room today. And uh, I, I point that out just so that uh, everyone's aware that the information that is provided um, uh, will be, uh, or I guess the, the folks in this room who are today's uh, leaders of Portland and of Oregon and tomorrow's, uh, they will hold the uh, speakers accountable uh, for that information. Um, it tr truly more, it may be in this sense than in others. Um, and my question, actually I, I am dying to ask two questions, but I know that's really improper. The, however, the first one is what do the test results show for the pit that has been dug <clears throat> um, in the area where the uh, drilling will occur. But the real question is, would British Petroleum or the Alaska Coalition be willing to publicly support price increases uh, for crude oil or for refined petroleum products uh, that would be specifically, uh, the price increases for, for monies that would be specifically earmarked for environmental protection uh, as a part of developing oil resources in the Alaska National Wildlife Refuge? So your answers probably don't have to be construed as those of your respective uh, organizations, but please answer them if you'd care to. Well, the problem with answering the question, which I can answer, is that it doesn't really matter what British Petroleum is willing to support. I mean, it's what the Congress of the United States is willing to support, and there is not probably a single congressman out of the 535 that we have there uh, that will support five cents on the price for a gallon of gas at the moment. And so that, as a solution, is not terribly practical in political terms. BP is on record as supporting uh, that sort of solution, albeit we do it very quietly, obviously, because it's, not, because it's not popular. 
but we think there has to be some sort of curbing of demand. And if, it, um, if the only practical way of achieving that is by adding some tax, and if, uh, if you can further uh, sweeten the pie, if you like, by using that tax for environmental protection, we spend huge amounts of money protecting the environment already, so we're certainly proponents of that, uh, we would support it. Well, <coughs> there are two things, uh, there are two p sorts of price increases that I do not get upset about. One is fuel, and the other is interest. Now, when it comes to fuel, if, if I see that the price goes up at the beginning of the war, and I know that the base price of oil has not gone up, at one level I get outraged, because I know that it's resulting in someone else's profits, not mine. However, on another level I have to respond that this, there is tremendous elasticity of supply and demand with oil. And once that price goes up, people drive less. So I feel relieved. I pay that money, even, I know, even when I know it go, goes to the oil industries who don't need it. I pay that gladly because, I me because it means less carbon monoxide, fewer people driving, um, and I think we all gain by that. I think it is absolutely ridiculous that the gasoline now costs uh, less than it did, what, 60 years ago, as Roger said. It is, it, is, it is ludicrous that we right now in 1991 are tying ourselves in knots when had the government simply gone in in 1984 or so and started imposing taxes to keep the gasoline price what it was back then rather than allowing it to fall, we could have made a very large dent in our national debt. There's all sorts of other things we could have done. We could have made a very large contribution towards educating our people. Now, the fact that we've let that go by, I think, is irresponsible. Now, I, would sp I can't speak for the members of the Arctic National Wildlife Co Coalition or the Alaska Coalition of Washington, of which there are some 80,000. Um, I can speak for myself. I would gladly pay more money, but I will not gladly pay more money to allow drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, because I don't think that that is the issue on debate. I guess the question really becomes, since you're more numerous than us, I mean, how much money are you willing to spend? Vivian Solomon, City Club member. I'd like Mr. Herrera to please respond to a point raised by Mr. Eustace during his portion of the debate. And as I understood it specifically, that Alaskan oil will not satisfy the United States' need for very long. And given that, if it's correct, why use the funds for that drilling as opposed to the conservation that he has suggested? Well, I think you have to do both. That's my point. You can't uh, solve this problem just with conservation, despite uh, what Mr. Eustace said. I mean, what he said is fine in theory, but it will not work in practice because we cannot afford to pay the sort of um, um, uh, prices that he's uh, quoting. Um, Alaskan oil, I don't know what figures he gave because I, I quite frankly uh, don't listen to them any longer because the one thing I can tell you with a great deal of certainty is neither he nor I knows how much oil there is beneath the coastal plain, so figures are some, somewhat meaningless. But Alaskan oil has been produced now for 20 years from the North Slope and it's uh, presently supplying 25% of our nation's domestic production. It'll keep on going for another 10 or 15 years. Now, is 35 years of oil worthwhile or not, especially in the volumes that come from there? I would argue that clearly it is. I mean, I think everybody in this room should recognize that because we all use it. And uh, if we do uh, find significant quantities beneath the coastal plain, exactly the same situation will prevail. That, that oil will supply this nation for another 35 years into the future. Now, the problem with oil, and I'm just going to throw this out at you, and I, I suspect that many of you know it, that there's more oil in the world today than there ever has been in the last 130 years of the oil era. The world has a trillion barrels of recoverable oil known about today. So oil, although it uh, obviously is a finite resource, seems to be a sustainable resource. And to wish our way out of using it when it's clearly the cheapest, the most uh, practical source of energy that we have today, it is just that. It's wishful thinking. It's not going to happen unless we're willing to face up to the costs associated with substituting it for something else. 
Um, there were a couple of other bills that were proposed besides the Energy Security Act. One was um, the Bryan Bill, which would mandate the, the CAFE, the corporate, corporate average fuel uh, efficiency standards for automobiles would go up 40% to the year 2000, up to 40 miles per gallon. The other was the Barbara Boxer Bill, for Representative Boxer, and that would call um, for the CAFE standards to go up to 45 miles per gallon, 60%. The, the, by the year 2000, this would result in an annual savings under the Bryan Bill of something like 2.5 million barrels um, per year. Um, under um, the Boxer Bill, it would be 3.1 million barrels, excuse me, million barrels per day. Now, the estimate that 2.5 million barrels per day, 3.1 million barrels per day, under those two scenarios, 40 and 60 percent increase in efficiency, each of those would be would far exceed the amount that we are importing from the Persian Gulf, the amount that we could get from the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, and from the Outer Continental Shelf of California, all combined. But none if, of those bills will pass. That's the problem. That th that is the problem. Right now, I think we are approaching the point where we can no longer dither. The, the, import, the gains that can be made through energy efficiency are so far greater than the gains that we can make by drilling more that it has to be a main point of our energy policy. Isaac Regan, Strife Club member. I'm uh, always intrigued by the use of job impact studies in public policy debates. Um, I would be interested, Mr. Herrera, in knowing how drilling for uh, oil in Alaska would create 30,000 jobs in Oregon, and I uh, would also be interested uh, from Mr. Eustace in knowing uh, if they did any job impact studies with regard to the environmental scenario that uh, he mentioned. Well, as I mentioned, it was the Walton School of Economics, in essence, that put this uh, those figures together, or at least uh, arrived at those figures. Um, but the, uh, and I can't comment on their accuracy, obviously, I'm not an expert in that field. But I can certainly envisage that uh, they're probably the right order of magnitude simply by my direct knowledge of how much income has accrued to the Oregon economy from the development on the North Slope uh, over the last 15 years. And I mean, I know where our bills go. And if the bill is paid in Oregon, I presume it benefits the Oregon uh, business community, et cetera. And uh, hundreds of millions of dollars have come directly into the Oregon economy from that development. And obviously, those hundreds of millions of dollars represent jobs in Oregon. And so that's why I suspect that the, um, the Walton estimates might well be accurate. Um, I, I frankly do not think that you're going to see uh, any of those 30,000 jobs, certainly not to the extent that, as if a, I don't know, a, a Toyota plant decided to open in um, Oregon and produce uh, 98 mile per gallon vehicles, then you might see 30,000 jobs. I, if the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge opens, what will happen is that the employment base and the in support base that now supports Prudhoe will then start moving over to um, uh, the Arctic. Um, in the time that Prudhoe has been on, been in operation, uh, several other oil fields have come on to operation. Yet words like kuparik uh, aren't things that people talk about on the streets of Portland when they talk Portland when they talk about um, uh, how great the economy is. I, I don't think that you'll see it. This is very very speculative. In terms of employment impacts of putting increased investment into renewable energy and into energy efficiency, what, what it will come down to um, is the gains that will go into those who um, manufacture things like this, fluorescent light bulbs. This light bulb, compact fluorescent, burns one-sixth the amount of energy. It estimates are one-tenth to one-sixth the amount of energy of a 75-watt bulb. Now, those who make these, ho hopefully it'll be us and not foreigners, are those who are going to recover these gains. Furthermore, those who make the investments into you know, bioma biomass conversion for renewable energy, um, methanol and ethanol, 
those who make the investments into efficient hydro are going to be the ones who, um, who recover this economic benefit. The other thing that you have to look at is if we are not put, buying half of our oil from the other part of the world, um, that is money that stays at home. It doesn't go abroad. And that is money that will create more jobs. Ray Polanyi, a City Club member. I, I guess we can safely admit that we are addicted to oil. And I guess the question is, uh, should the response be to feed the addiction, or should it rather be to provide a cure in the form of alternatives? And I'm thinking uh, Mr. Herrera's remark of what's happening in Europe and Japan, where there are alternatives to the use of the automobile, where, where rails and public transit uh, are readily available. Uh, and, and the question is then, how to in our country? Well, the first step would be, I think, through greater fuel efficiency within the automobile. Um, and this is by no means pie in the sky. Uh, Volvo has in production a vehicle that can get uh, 63 in city, 81 on the highway. Renault has one, 100 in the city, 183 on the highway. Toyota has one, 98 miles per gallon. You know, I, and I d really don't think it's because the, of members of the um, uh, United Auto Workers who are in there screaming about jobs. If they really cared about their jobs, what they would be doing is screaming to their management that they should try retrofit. Yet, how many vehicles with mileage like that have you seen coming out of Detroit? Take a look at the new vehicles that are coming out. What you find is they are bigger, they are heavier, they are more powerful. For something like the third year in a row, the corporate average fuel economy for our cars has fallen, it hasn't increased. Now, from 1973 to 86, the average fleet mileage for our vehicles doubled from something like 4.2 miles to the gallon to 28.6 miles to the gallon. These next increases are not impossible. They are directly attainable. You could get a, something like a 12% increase if we went to front wheel drive. Another 10% increase if we started using um, constant velocity transmissions. Another 12% increase if we used um, aluminum blocks. Something like another 10% increase if we went for, to six and four cylinder engines. All of that is off the shelf stuff. What we lack apparently is the willpower to put it in. May I just make a comment? I don't think we lack the willpower at all, albeit uh, there are certainly improvements that can be made. When you look at the efficiency, energy efficiency of the eastern seaboard of the United States of America, where there are huge population concentrations, you find it's just as efficient as that of Japan. Uh, the problem that America has is its geography. It's so spread out. I mean, I talked about four gallons of uh, petroleum products per person in Oregon. In California, it's only two gallons per person. Now, are you any less efficient in California? You would argue no, and I think you're right. They have the economy of huge population um, um, numbers. And, and so basically, there's nothing wrong with our ability to use technology to conserve in this country. It is equal to that of Europe and Japan. What is wrong is the fact that we have 3,000 miles of empty spaces, which is a penalty that we pay heavily for. Edith Saban, member of the City Club. I believe that our present recession commenced with the Arab oil boycott. Uh, this talk about uh, the problem with the, uh, the motor companies and the, the perfection of the cars. When I was in Vancouver, BC during the, uh, uh, the exposition, I saw cars on display that have already been perfected and were shown that will take a minimum of 25 miles a gallon of gas and possibly to 35 and better than that. Why don't we do something about that, gentlemen, instead of statistics, facts, and so on and so forth. The, the product is there. Make them release it. Let's cut out the lobby. What do you think about that? It's a good idea. If, if, if you purchased gasoline on your stay in Canada, you would also find that it was in the realm of whatever it is, $1.80 uh, close to, and upwards when you get out of Vancouver, over $2 a gallon. I, I think that would be a very good <laughs> reason, explanation for it. You know, what you say is absolutely correct, but it's because we don't buy those cars that they're not on the market. Now, do we force people to buy them or not? 
You know, another approach to this, if one's worried about conserving energy, is to get rid of old cars, which are clearly less efficient. Get rid of the old clunkers, give an incentive to people to get rid of a car which is more than 10 years old. And in one fell swoop, you'd, uh, you'd decrease the, the automobile pollution in this country by orders of magnitude, and you would increase the efficiency of the remaining vehicles on the road by orders of magnitude. Now, that's an approach which nobody seriously uh, proposes, but it's one which uh, has far quicker rewards than, than cafe standards. And I'm not, uh, I'm not arguing against cafe standards. I agree we've got to conserve in that fashion. But the political reality of it is that we, as a population this country, are not willing to do that. Uh, two more questions. Uh, Mike Fahey, City Club. Question. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, environmental groups have consistently opposed uh, oil exploration, almost any exploration really, uh, offshore in Oregon, offshore in Washington, offshore in California, offshore on the East Coast, offshore in Alaska, in the Anwar, and in the overthrust belt. Now, I believe in uh, using efficient vehicles, and I believe in the environment, but we also, and, and are also opposed to using our hydroelectric power as fully as we can. We're going to have a big reduction in power there, and have opposed uh, nuclear plants, even modern plants constructed that would uh, be of a standard design and are used extensively throughout Europe. We're not talking about whether we increase the amount of oil or, or resources or energy in this area, the position of the environmental groups has been a net reduction in what's available to us. Yeah, the question is, how do you square that? Why do you always argue each specific issue? If you look at the whole thing, ANWR is one of the many things being opposed by the uh, environmental groups. Why won't you support uh, responsible exploration in this country? If we don't do that, we do import oil from places that don't care about it. Well, I, I think the, what you, uh, I guess, asked, why don't we support, support responsible oil development, I suppose, in the Arctic? I, would, it, I think the, the question or the term is, is an oxymoron. Um, even, even, well, anywhere, it's just, it's simply not true. There is no resistance to all the development that's going on around Prudhoe Bay, around the area of Kuparik. Um, there is no resistance that's going on in, te in Texas, in Louisiana. The, um, basically, in, the, in existing fields, not new fields, there are estimates of something like, 100 billion barrels that's recoverable. And the environmental position would be first look to those areas where there are proven reserves, where people already are drilling, as opposed to going into new frontiers. The problem with going into the Arctic um, is that, which represents, what, 8% of the entire Arctic coastline, is an incredibly you know, fragile environment. Uh, it's frequented every year by something like 170,000 caribou. There are still um, native groups who rely upon that source of caribou, just like there were native groups who relied upon the buffalo and there were native groups who relied upon the salmon. Um, you have a natural resource which continues intact. The question is, why start making dents into that resource? Um, the Department of Interior forecasted that there would be dramatic declines for the caribou herd, as there would be for other species. What you're talking about doing is taking basically a spider web of gravel pads and roads and spreading it out over the, the, the refuge. Um, with regard to the OCS, I mean, what I indicated was the amount of gains that you would get by going into the Arctic and the OCS are really so minuscule in comparison to what the need is that there really is not a any useful purpose served by that environmental degradation. Under the scenario that was advanced by the Union of Concerned Scientists, or hardly a radical environmental group, there would be an actual decrease in the energy demand um, between now and the year 2030. I think it's, you, you begin, as I said at the beginning, you begin by assuming your own conclusion if you immediately begin the debate with 
an assumption that there needs to be increased production and you need to go into more areas. Um, this caribou business is total baloney. There are more caribou in the state of Alaska than there are people. If you want to look at an endangered species, you're looking at one here, an oil person from the state of Alaska. Let me just explain why. You know, 10 years ago in this country, there were 14,000 independent oil companies. Today, there are 4,000, and probably half of those are on the brink of bankruptcy. Now, that didn't happen from choice. That happened as a result of much of the opposition to all development by the environmental, the more extreme environmental organizations. And you know, the problem I have is that the Audubon Society can produce oil from wildlife refuges, and yet nobody else has that capability. Our immediate extinction problem is, is that of time, I'm afraid. <laughs> and so I, I'm afraid we don't have time for any further questions. Thank you, Jeff Eustace and Roger Herrera, for presenting viewpoints on conservation today. We're adjourned. <laughs>